Um, good evening. It is Tuesday, July 28th, and this is a joint meeting of the Town Council and the Amherst School Committee. We are here for the purposes of hearing and discussing the Crocker Farm School Expansion Report. So let me just begin by saying we are allowed to meet remotely based on Governor Baker's March 12th order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law, um, 30A, paragraph 20. This allows us to meet virtually and both as a town council and as a school committee. The sole purpose of this meeting, as I mentioned before, is for the report and any public comment will be a report. I will call upon each counselor by name and at that time they should unmute their mic and say present. They will, that will indicate that they can hear me and we can hear them. And then please remember to mute your mic again after saying present. This is how we will conduct counselor comments and other comments throughout the agenda. So let me begin. Um, Shawnee Ball Milne is going to be late. She informed me of that. Alyssa Brewer. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Darcy DeMont. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Present. Dorothy Pam. Present. Evan Ross. Not I was just at another meeting with Evan. He should be here in a second, depending on traffic. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate that. Um, George Ryan. I'm here. Uh, Kathy Shane. Here. Steve Schreiber. Here. Andy Steinberg. Here. And I know that Sarah Schwartz is absent today. Okay, so we do expect to be joined by Evan Ross and Melanie Bullmill. I'm sorry? Evan, Evan here. here. Ah, Evan, thank you. Okay. Um, we are now going to I'm now going to call the meeting to order officially. Uh, and the time is 733. And that's the meeting of the council. And now I'm going to turn it over to um, Allison McDonald who will do the same for the school committee and make sure that all the members of the school committee can hear and be heard. Thank you. Um, so I, I do see a presence of a quorum of the Amherst School Committee. So I will um, take a roll call attendance. Um, Mr. Demling. Demling present. Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Ms. Lord. Lord present. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. And McDonald present. We are now to order at 7.34. Thank you. Um, along with the town manager, Paul Bachman, we do expect to be joined later by the superintendent of schools, Mike Morris, and we do have Crocker Farm Principal Derek Shea uh, with us. Um, I want to make sure that both Paul and Derek can hear me. Paul? Yes. And Derek? Yes. Thank you. And Mike's not there yet. Okay. Um, Lynn, I, Lynn, I am here actually. Oh, I can't see you in this huge spread, but thanks, Mike. Um, I now want to make sure that all the presenters can hear me and we can hear them. Jesse Saylor. Yes. And is Miranda Balkan arrived? Miranda Balkan, I'm sorry. No. Not at this point. Okay. And then Richard Kapek is with us as well. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, we have we want to recognize that other members of the Crocker Farm School Expansion Committee have joined us this evening. They are Maria Kapeki and Tony Cunningham. Um, ben Harrington, who's here also as a school board member, but is assistant facilities director. Uh, and the other are the others I've already recognized, and that's Mike Morris and Derek Shea. This meeting includes audio, video, and is available um, through Amherst Media. It is also being recorded. There is no chat room for the meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Athena know. And to make a comment, ask a question, please click the raise hand button. 
and I will decide how to address the situation. Discussion may be suspended while we address technical issues and the minutes will note if a disconnection occurs. Uh, Athena but will be monitoring the connections. Um, so I just wanna briefly mention uh, that on the official agenda that is posted on the town website, you'll see the announcements of all the various meetings coming up of the town council and on the school committee website, you can see the same. Um, so we're going to go immediately to our presentation. This preliminary feasibility study was recommended by way of a citizen's request to the Joint Capital Planning Committee, which then recommended town manager for inclusion in the FY20 capital plan. The town manager uh, came, brought that to the town council who also approved it in June of 2019. The purpose of the study was to estimate the useful life of the current building, conduct a feasibility study of possible additions and modifications to the school in light of possible district reconfiguration. We will start with a presentation, then follow with council and school committee questions. And if time permits, we will ask for public comment, but only pertaining to the study as it is presented. So with that, I'm going to call on Jesse Saylor. Thank you, Lynn. Jesse, I believe you're doing your own slides. Yes, I'm gonna share my screen now and see if it works. Okay, can you see my screen? Okay, wonderful. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Jesse Saylor. I'm the project manager at TSKP Studio. I've been working with um, Richard Sipic, uh, who's been introduced, the principal in charge of the project. Uh, last summer, Richard and I presented uh, an extensive feasibility study on the Fort River School here in Amherst. And so in this study of the Crocker Farm School, we've been able to build on our knowledge of your town and of your school system. Uh, and so that, that was an advantage. Um, we also had wonderful and truly dedicated collaborators on the feasibility study working committee. Uh, we have um, three residents and um, three district, district representatives. representatives. Uh, the study really began in February and completed in June. Um, and this group kept at it despite the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which I, I think is admirable. I should also mention that due to the timing of the pandemic, this study does not attempt to predict or anticipate changes in educational delivery or enrollment that may result in response to the pandemic. Um, this is based on projections and guidelines that were in place prior to the pandemic, uh, because that's what we had at the time. So why this study? Why look at Crocker Farm? You may uh, be wondering, isn't Crocker Farm in the best shape of the three elementary schools we have. That's, that's something I, I would expect to hear. Um, and after looking at Fort River and Crocker Farm, we would agree that Crocker is in better shape than Fort River. But what is the condition of the building really? Uh, we see inevitable facility improvements uh, in the near horizon. Uh, we see educational needs that are currently not being met. Um, and we're gonna go through those with you in the study. Another understandable question is something like, shouldn't we be focused on Fort River and Wildwood consolidation project? Is this study distracting us? And, and I know from experience that there's a tendency in a public forum to build support through sort of putting the blinders on. It's the um, squeakiest wheel that's going to get the grease, that sort of phenomenon. But by studying all three schools, I, I think you have the information you need to make a broad and holistic district-wide plan for your elementary schools. And I think that's really a primary goal of this report. We're filling in the Crocker Farm part, but we know there are other studies of Fort River and Wildwood that you have and you can pull from. Um, and we found very practical considerations uh, that will affect Crocker Farm from consolidating Fort River and Wildwood. Uh, enrollments at Crocker Farm would, will be affected in, in nearly all the scenarios we looked at. Also, there's the uh, possibility of sixth grade moving to the middle school. And so we wanted to look at that as part of this study to understand how Crocker Farm would be affected. So let's start looking at the condition of the building. Um, the roof, 
good place to start. Uh, there have been some roof leaks lately. Uh, I think there's uh, recent money been allocated towards skylight replacement to address those leaks as well. Uh, but the reality is the roof was put on with the renovation and back in 2002, it's coming to the end of its serviceable lifetime. So we would recommend that as part of a Crocker Farm project, it be replaced. Um, it also gives us a chance to increase the thickness in the roof and improve the thermal performance of the building envelope. Uh, the insulation thickness is currently three inches and could be doubled. Um, that's what we see these days. Um, photovoltaic readiness could be enhanced uh, by redoing the roof, uh, providing pathways for future photovoltaic panels, for example. Um, security, school security standards have evolved in the last decade, um, certainly since the renovation was completed. Um, with the current main entrance design, visitors can move unrestricted right into the building. Um, that's, that's not what we're designing these days. These days, like the diagram in the upper left, um, we are corralling visitors and forcing them into the administration area and then allowing them into the building to make sure everyone is checked. Um, and, and that could easily be done at Crocker Farm. Um, Crocker Farm also has the gym and the cafeteria um, identified here in the floor plans, uh, basically in the center of the building and surrounded by educational academic um, classrooms. This means that when they're used by the public after hours, these spaces require that the entire building be open to the public. That's something we try to avoid in school design. We try to zone these spaces um, to limit the public's access after hours. And then finally, you have a lot of um, first floor windows in the classrooms, which is a wonderful thing in terms of education, but from a security point of view, should probably be addressed by adding a security film to slow down an intrusion. Um, and, and so that's, that's what we would recommend be included in this project. Um, mechanical is always something we look at. In this case. Um, the univentilators in the classrooms are in need of a replacement. They're coming to the end of their serviceable lifetime. Um, they're relatively loud and they don't handle moisture control. Um, as they get to the end of their life, the dampers start to get stuck. And so their, their purpose to bring in fresh air starts to be compromised. Uh, and so we uh, recommend replacing them with an elect electric um, split type system. Um, the current boilers are, are in good shape and, and they'll go for a number of years longer, but they are fossil fuel sourced. And so we're proposing systems in this report that. Um, are electric and, and are, are forward thinking, but we are not proposing to uh, replace the boilers uh, because they have more life in them. Um, the air conditioning is, is not provided currently in the gym and the cafeteria, so as we're, we need to replace the chiller in this project, we can also um, extend it and, and provide air conditioning in those spaces. Um, and also roof mounted exhaust fans are in bad shape and um, should be replaced in the next few years. So we'd recommend doing that as part of this project. So we're picking off pieces of the mechanical system that, that need to be replaced. Much of it is in good shape and can remain. Also um, ADA non-compliance issues. Um, there was a report done by Kessler and McGinnis Associates prior to the feasibility study that we're drawing on. Um, there are a number of items some were um, funding for some of them was approved just this year uh, and we've tried to um, just focus um, our estimates on those items that are not addressed in, in this year's funding. Um, classroom entry doors lack clearance. The classroom sinks lack clearances below them. Toilet room accessibility is often something we see here. It just seems to be grab bar movements so it's, it's not, too, um, not too troublesome in terms of cost. The courtyards are inaccessible. Uh, we need accessible paths to the play areas. Um, some have it, some don't. Um, so all of these items are rolled up into our cost estimates, which we'll go through later. Um, currently, there's also unmet educational needs. Um, sorry. I'll just hit on a few of these. The, the gym is really about half the size. Uh, you would have at elementary school these days. It, it only provides one teaching space, which is, which is difficult for scheduling. Um, and, and so we, we typically would see two teaching spaces. Um, let's see. 
Um, the pre-K specialists such as speech and OTPT lack space near the pre-K classrooms and, and it's, their spaces are actually on another floor. So we shouldn't be asking students with reduced mobility to go to another floor for therapy. But with the way the building is currently laid out, that's kind of the best we can do. And so that's something that really needs to be addressed. Um, classroom educational space is compromised. It's reduced somewhat right now by the storage in the classroom in grades one through five. Uh, we can make those classrooms bigger and more functional just by putting the storage in the hall. So that's something we've included as a recommendation uh, as an educational improvement. Um, and then small group instruction often gets pushed out into the corridor at Crocker Farm, um, which can be distracting. The study looks at creating small group instruction rooms, which are acoustically separated and less distracting. So I'm not going to go through all of these, but that gives you a sense of the kind of educational needs we have. Um, so this study looks at how Crocker will be adapted to support changing enrollments uh, in conjunction with the superintendent and the New England School Development Council enrollment projections. Uh, we anticipate a certain number of students in the K through six um, grade range uh, over the next 10 years in Amherst, and that's 1,020 as given in the table on the left. Or if we look at the K through five cohort, assuming the sixth grade moves to the middle school, um, that number reduces down to 840 students. Um, so then the study figures how many different ways, what would be the what would be the breakdown of these students between the two schools, between Crocker Farm and the consolidated school? Uh, and we kind of pick the most obvious um, scenarios that stand out. We have five of them actually. Um, and trying to go through this rather quickly, the largest K-6 possible enrollment at the consolidated school is the first one, that's 600 students. And so then the remaining students end up at the Crocker Farm School. Uh, we have two scenarios, um, two and three, which look at dividing the students up evenly between the two schools. It also divides up the pre-K program and the special education program. This, this is the district-wide special education programs. Um, and, and so uh, in the K-6 cohort, that's actually the largest enrollment that we look at at Crocker Farm when they're divided equally. Um, we also have our scenario four, which is very similar to scenario one. It's actually fewer K through six students at the consolidated school, but it's an even four sections per grade. And so this breaks up nicely into the dual language program, um, which would take two sections uh, per grade. And this would allow two non-dual language sections um, to be at the consolidated school. And, and I think that's somewhat an ideal situation. Um, this pushes a few more students over to Crocker Farm, um, but it's one we wanted to look at because it was ideal. And then finally, scenario five is our only scenario that does not increase the number of students that are at Crocker Farm now. Um, and the reason we can do this in scenario five is while well, we build a, a larger consolidated school, but scenario five is another one of those scenarios in which the sixth grade has moved to the middle school. So when, when that happens, the, um, the number of students allows for um, fewer students to be at Crocker Farm than all the other scenarios. Um, we also developed a range of um, addition options or approaches to the existing building, um, build, building-wide options. It's, it's easiest to identify them through the size of the addition. Option A is this, this color, it's, it's right here. It's um, sort of the middle-sized addition, if you will. It accommodates an enrollment increase, but not a large enrollment increase, which is option B. And that's all this blue, this larger footprint here. Um, whereas option C is this smaller pink addition. It doesn't accommodate any enrollment increase, but it does address educational and uh, facility needs. Um, so it, it deals with the gym, it provides a new gym, um, even though you're not taking on additional students in, in option C. And finally, option D doesn't have an addition, doesn't show up here. It's really just a base repair option. It's, it's looking at the cost to address facility needs um, alone, and it's not getting into educational needs and improvements required for educational um, requirements.
Now we've, um, we've considered that there's flexibility within these options. You may be wondering why we have five enrollment scenarios, but only three options. And that's because um, we, we found that we were able to accommodate three of the enrollment scenarios with option A, for example. Um, this is a diagram that shows how we would modify um, our, our diagram of enrollment scenario one in option A addition um, to, um, to accommodate enrollment scenario three. And by swapping out the uses of some of these classrooms, uh, changing the names basically, um, we're able to accommodate scenario three with the same footprint and floor plan that was accommodating scenario one. And so we thought this is a really smart thing um, that you could have some flexibility uh, in your building to be able to uh, accommodate different populations. Uh, we know the reality is that um, school populations change over time. Um, well, if option A accommodates three, option B, which is the large addition, of course, accommodates more. I don't, get, I don't hear you, Bob. Accommodate all of you. Yeah. Told you. Um, whereas option C, which has no increase uh, enrollment, um, is a smaller building altogether. It, it just accommodates the current enrollment of the Crocker Farm School. So there may be some advantage in building a slightly larger building if it, if it provides flexibility, such as option A. All right, so here we have site plans of the, the options. Uh, we, we just wanna show you that we, we looked at um, how the site is impacted as part of this study. Uh, in, in all the options, you'll see where we're building the addition at the southeast end of the building. It's a new gym in all options and then some support spaces, classroom spaces. Uh, we're also reconfiguring where the gym used to be to create classroom spaces. And, and we also have these reconfigurations uh, for small group instruction rooms, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so that's the building part. Um, as it relates to the site, we looked at parking capacities uh, for the school and we looked at the increased number of buses and vans that would be required depending on uh, the enrollment scenario that we were looking at. And we found that the parking um, capacity was sufficient to support these uh, increases in enrollment, which in most cases are rel relatively modest increases. Um, we also found that the um, bus queuing space um, that's at the, at, at the school right now is sufficient to accommodate the additional buses. If we look at option B, um, which is the largest enrollment increase, uh, and this is our largest addition, um, we realized that there was a potential improvement to the kind of operations of the existing school uh, that relieved some of the pressure uh, on the main entry of the school in terms of vehicular movements and actually freed up parking space in a way. And so we wanted to make that suggestion. It's something that would be studied further, uh, but the suggestion was to have the buses and vans actually come in via the Shea Street uh, entry uh, and use what, what appears to be a kind of bus loop here, which is currently just used for parent drop-off in the morning, I believe. Um, and by doing that, you pull a lot of the congestion away from the front of the school and you could potentially have visitor spaces up in front where you kind of expect them to be, but they're not there now because they get uh, sort of locked in by the buses at drop off and pick up time. Um, so that was, that seemed like a potential interesting study. And finally option C um, is many of the same solutions as option A. It's, uh, it's actually a little bit smaller than option A in terms of parking and uh, vehicular use. So it, it works well. Uh, we also developed detailed space allocation plans as part of the study. I won't go through every room with you, uh, but we did actually develop lists of every single room for all of these enrollment scenarios and we developed floor plans of where they would all fit. I say this so that you have some um, comfort and knowing that the gross square footages that we developed for the Crocker Farm uh, options are based in, in reality. There, there's um, something that we've worked out that um, is a basis for these gross square footages. It's not just a spreadsheet design. Uh, we also looked at a sub option, which, I, which I've mentioned earlier, the, the question of 
um, small group instruction and how it's handled. And we weren't sure that this was like a um, hundred percent something that you'd you'd find completely necessary. We weren't sure if you, you we don't think you have this in any of your schools right now. In fact, I know you don't. Uh, but would you be putting this into your new school? It is something we're seeing a lot in 21st century education, and, and we found we could accommodate it by reconfiguring the classrooms, uh, the partitions in the corner of the classrooms to create a a small group instruction room, which is accessed by each um, classroom, which is adjacent to it. So it's basically shared and, and the two um, classrooms would need to kind of coordinate on their use of this room. Um, but it, it was an option that we, we thought would, uh, you might be interested in. It, it's forward thinking. Um, I just want to mention Mike and Mark's we, hand up and I wondered if he had a comment he wanted to make here. Yeah, so we do have that uh, those rooms in Pelham, uh, which is not okay. a district that that you've been to, but it is a district that um, I'm superintendent of as well. And so we are very familiar with uh, the structure of those and also how we might integrate use between two rooms. So um, thank you for that. You know, I just wanted to let the, the community know we do have an example within our districts um, and we do make good use of that room. So I appreciate you including it. Thank you. Yes, we did include the cost for this, but we also made sure to itemize it, um, which is, is given there. Okay, so um, the cost summary. Um, the study outlined a scope of work for each Crocker Farm building option and estimates were, were de developed for, for each building option. And, and so they're given here in this column. Uh, and we can see that the cost for base repair at the very bottom was $9.25 million. Um, so that's a, a, a pretty good cost, um, considering that the cost to do the addition and, and meet your educational and facility needs double at 20, um, 20,750,000. Or if, if we were to make the, the, large, um, the larger addition, it's 27 million. Um, so there's, there's a pretty good jump up to make the larger addition. Um, for the consolidated school, um, this study relies on our work from the Fort River study, specifically our option A we developed for Fort River as well as option C um, for the addition renovation. Um, this slide reports the cost to Amherst, uh, anticipating that the MSBA will participate in the um, project cost. The actual project cost of the consolidated school in our study ranges from 64 to $75 million. So this slide is just reporting the cost to town. This is taking out the MSBA's participation um, in the consolidated school. Um, so um, finally, in the column on the far right, you can see the combined cost um, showing the, uh, the cost to town for um, the Crocker Farm project plus the consolidated school um, as a new or ad reno. Um, and so uh, sorry. We can see that um, of the enrollment scenarios we, we looked at, one, two, and four are pre-K to six enrollment scenarios. Uh, so these are more students um, in the combined two schools and have higher costs. Um, of the three of them, we see that option two, which is the idea of splitting evenly between the two schools, has the highest cost of all. Um, and this sort of makes sense. Um, you're, you're building more at Crocker Farm and you don't have um, state participation, or we're assuming you don't have state participation in the Crocker Farm at this point. Um, and so that's going to drive up those costs a little bit higher. Uh, whereas options three and five are looking at the use of the middle school for sixth grade. Uh, so these are just pre-K through five options. Um, and these are, um, are, are lower. Uh, we're looking at about um, $11 million lower in general uh, if, if that decision is made. And then if we compare three and five, we can see that three which splits evenly between um, Crocker Farm and the Consolidated School is coming in a little bit higher um, than five, um, which is a scenario which keeps Crocker Farm with the enrollment that it currently has. 
uh, but still meets the educational and facility needs at Crocker Farm. Um, so that's our, that's our cost summary. Um, we have some questions there, we can come back to it. Um, these are the, this is the design team uh, I'm wrapping up here. Um, again, it was TSKP Studio. We worked with our professional cost estimators at A.M. Pogarty, our MEP engineers at Kola Ronan. Um, the study pulls from uh, another study done by Kristen Hayes Consulting of the Early Childhood Program in, in school, in, in your district. Um, and it also pulls from the accessibility report done by Kessler McGinnis Associates. All right. Why don't you take the slides down, but be prepared to pull them back up if there's questions regarding certain slides. Sure. And so we're going to move now to questions from questions or comments from the school committee and the town council. And Peter Demling, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. So um, I, I think you have it up, but if, if not, if you could pull the uh, the cost summary um, slide up. So first of all, thank you. I appreciate you um, taking the time to do this. Um, so uh, one quick question then, and then a general comment. Um, so I appreciated getting the slides this morning. Um, if there's also a report that goes with this, that would be good. It would have been good to have before this so that we could dive into it and ask further questions. Um, my main concerns with this slide, um, so the, the purpose of this study, as I understood it, was to uh, a feasibility study of, of the Crocker Farm, of expanding Crocker Farm, not, not to estimate what the eventual cost of the not even yet begun MSBA project for um, a, a building project to replace Fort River and Wildwood. Um, that, that, that building committee has not even been formed yet. Uh, it's, it's, its work will be ongoing for a number of years. Uh, it, it will eventually produce cost esti estimates uh, after, after many public input uh, sessions, after a very careful planning. Uh, and it will be a very considered careful process because once those numbers are public, uh, it will become the basis for um, speculating about debt exclusion overrides. And it will, as you're probably aware, it was a very difficult process uh, that failed in our town a number of years ago. So with this, with this being a public document, with now numbers attached to consolidated cost to town, it's very difficult. Um, and you know, we had the, um, uh, the, we had the, uh, the town council president read the purpose of the study and it was very clear of what the scope of the study was. Um, and and I'm, sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure this was meant as, as very sincerely just, just to be helpful um, but the, the, the study you mentioned, that Fort River feasibility study, was, was very narrowly focused on Fort River feasibility and it was uh, very much decoupled from what the current MSBA process was. And, and I'm, uh, if, as a school committee member, I'm very sensitive to accepting reports, which we then own as a committee, which had the, have the numbers attached to them, uh, which, which we are then, you know, bound to then explain to the public. Um, so. I, you know, I would ask which if, if, you, if you do have a report that you're going to submit to us in, in a document, you know, that we would, would want to first also all this red and orange, we, you know, with that kind of stuff would have to be removed first um, in, 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 my, uh, in my view. Um, Pat DeAngelis, you have your hand up. Thank you. Um, I want to thank the committee for working on this, but in, in sounds to me like what happened is that the committee began to look at these projects as in a whole uh, and that what the um, amount of money um, should not be removed from the report. It's very important. I think it gives us some real insight into what are some possibilities. Um, it also seems to me that uh, however long it's going to take to decide about Fort River Wildwood and make that construction happen, Crocker Farm needs work now. And so why are we going to not deal with the money and not look at these things together? I, I think Peter's view is rather limited. Let me take some other accounts for our school committee comments before we come back to Peter. Are there any other comments 
this time from people. Questions? Yes, Darcy. Sorry. Um, I would just say that um, I really appreciate this study, especially being um, a counselor from District 5. Uh, I think that uh, you know, there, there's uh, oh, you know a feeling that that Crocker Farm might uh, you know when if when we have the consolidated school that um, there may be if you know a feeling in town that that the the students going to the consolidated school have a bright shiny school with everything great and that then the Crocker Farm students will be the second class. <laughs> But um, I, so I like that there is, there is this, this study that allows us to look at sort of equalizing um, services between the new consolidated school and Crocker Farm and, and equalizing, bring, bringing Crocker Farm up to speed on the HVAC system. And, um, you know, I really appreciate that um, you've looked into the roof and trying to, you know, just looking at how it could possibly be solar ready, how we could possibly not use fossil fuels. Um, I think that uh, all of, of that is really good and looking at all the different options. I personally, you know, have taught a lot in my career and I was all, uh, at almost every school I was at was K through five. So the, the moving kids to sixth grade, um, moving the sixth grade to the middle school um, doesn't, you know, seems like it's a natural um, answer to some of our financial issues here around the school. Um, I just have one question and that is, I just w wondered if, um, uh, Jesse could mention anything about the experience of your firm with um, net zero buildings. Sure, sure. Um, net zero is something that um, we're increasingly doing in our practice with public elementary schools. Uh, we actually have four on the boards right now in Connecticut. Um, and that's something that has, has really um, come about in just the last year, year and a half that um, net zero has moved to um, public schools. So um, it, in general, in terms of sustainability, I think our firm has always been a leader. We did the first, I believe, lead silver um, school building in the state of Connecticut. So going way back. Um, and, and so we hope that uh, these net zero projects that we're working on will become some of the first net zero schools in the state of Connecticut. I don't, I don't believe there is one right now. Um, Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, Kathy, Shane? I'm just I, I'm looking, for the, I'm looking for the unmute button. Unmuted. Um, I just, I'd like to understand the options a little bit better. So um, Crocker currently has pre-K in it. And so if I look at option five, where the sixth grade has moved up, how many are in, I looked up the number, so I, I think I know the answer, but I, how many are in the K through five group? Um, so the 435 is the entire Crocker, correct? So I correct. should say, so subtracting out pre-K, because one of the insights I think this is giving us is that if the sixth grade moves up, Crocker has room for more K through fivers. Um, it's absorbing another 60 or so kids because their sixth grade has moved. So that, but that, so the, the, the re, I'm just trying to do how many other kids do we have to have? And if we don't move them up, Crocker has to get a lot bigger, I think is what this also says, because if we're not going to build another school that's bigger than 600, so the playing off between them. But that option five, if Crocker's not getting any bigger, it's housing, um, am I looking at it's housing 360, you know, the Crocker form, you see the vertical column says K through six, but the 
horizontal says K through five. So I think- I'm sorry, that may be confusing. The hope the was- 360 is the number of kids in K through five? Correct. And so what I do is I subtract that 360 from 840 to see how much, how many have to be in the other school. That and can it's over them. here, 480. Yep. yep. Oh, yeah. Okay. So it's, you know, we've been, you know, just seeing these kinds of numbers where that's not, Crocker's not getting any bigger. Um, and then you've given up a, a, some numbers. If we just fix Crocker, you know, the basic repairs were at 9 million. If we address some of the educational issues, we jump up, you know, with the gym and ADA. So I think it's very useful to be, be bouncing because I hadn't been thinking of a new school in the under 500 range. I've always been thinking of it as 600. Right. Um, but we can't get to 600 unless the sixth grade moves up. So it would have to move up out of Crocker also is what I think your numbers are. Unless we want to build a new school that has excess capacity um, for growth, you know, that we want to, don't want to bet that we're always going to be at the current size. Um, so I'm reading these correctly then. Yeah. And did you at all... I mean, I know you weren't asked to do this, but if we were reconfiguring Crocker and uh, there was any thought of the pre-K would be better in another place, does the pre-K not being in Crocker, does it free up two or three classrooms worth of K through fivers or K through sixers? It, it could. Um... And, and you're, it's true, we don't have a scenario that removes pre-K from Crocker, but we, um, we did in the report address the potential for those classrooms to be converted to um, higher grade use. Um, the space of those classrooms is, is sufficient. Their, their full classroom size is actually a little bit larger, um, but it's some of the built-in furnishings that um, are targeted towards a pre-K um, student age that would need to be modified to make that conversion. Um, but no, it, it, it totally could, could happen. And you could increase the number of K through six students at Crocker Farm by doing that, by moving pre-K to another site. Um, in all of our scenarios, we kept pre-K in one of the two schools. There could be another place that it goes perhaps, or maybe it just moves to the consolidated school. That's another option. Okay, so, so personally, I, I find it useful to see the um, consolidated school as what happens as Crocker gets bigger, smaller to the other. But um, thank you for that, because the, the costs are somewhat daunting unless someone tells us that MSVA is willing to consider the costs of renovating, um, bringing, repairing Crocker and participate with us. Um, it's not a, a, a small margin on the school that we're committed to doing. Um, or moving forward. So thank you. All right, uh, moving on. Uh, Dorothy? Um, I have a couple of points. First, the inner classes. Um, I see in the drawings that maybe you're, it's the words courtyard. Um, those classrooms have no fresh air on either side. Is that correct? And you are going to somehow provide fresh air by making courtyards? I didn't see that in the text, but um, I knew that that was a problem. And um, some of the drawings have the little white spaces. Are, are those actual open to the air? Yes, the courtyards exist um, in the Crocker Farm School now. Okay. Um, so at those courtyards, we're not changing the configuration. Mm -hmm. uh, when you talk about fresh air it's issues, um, it could be that the unit ventilators provided to the, to the rooms at those courtyards are in need of repair. I'm not sure, I, I'm not aware of fresh air issues, particularly around the classrooms, of, around the courtyards. Well, I um, thought there was supposed to be a one window to the, to the outside in every classroom. Is that not so? Um, yes, uh, and these courtyards are, are large enough to allow for daylight um, and, and some views. These are much larger than the very small light shaft courtyards that we have at the Fort River School. Mm -hmm. um, let's see if we have a photograph of, I think the ADA slide had, a, had one. Um, 
And so here, here's a picture of what the courtyard at Crocker Farm looks like. Um, and uh, so we're continuing to use those as part of our renovation approach. Um, there are um, the music room and the art room currently border um, the courtyards. Um, we are moving general education classrooms. Let me go back. Sorry. Ah, hang on. Uh, we are moving general education classrooms to the perimeter where we can. Um, mm -hmm. But in some cases, we are still using interior courtyards for general education classrooms to get light and views. Um, I think it's just the difference in the size of the courtyard. Um, mm -hmm. If you were to put the Port River courtyard in, in the floor plan, it's only the corner of this courtyard. And so mm -hmm. it's not really a space you could ever enter. Um, and it really doesn't provide very much light. Because I, I know it wasn't your task to be dealing with um, COVID-19, but my mind is there. And sure. um, so some of my comments are, I think what I like about net zero is that when we worry about heating costs, we build for compact buildings. And we don't, I don't think we want compact buildings. I think we want more space, more air. And so net zero would make that seem a little bit less difficult. Um, and I mean, fresh air and circulation is, is really at a premium so that um, I, I'm, it's really crossing my mind that wouldn't, if we are ever going to get our public schools, elementary schools open for in-person education, that um, maybe we should have three small elementary schools. Do you have any other questions, Dorothy? No. Okay. Allison. Thank you. Um, thank you. This uh, was a, a, a helpful presentation, um, and uh, it's, it's great to see the results after. I know you've been working on this for a while, even in pandemic. Um, I have a question on the enrollment scenarios um, first, and then another sort of comment. Um, the, the, so the first question is, I, I find the enrollment scenarios um, one through five a little confusing, um, and I'm not sure which one sort of is 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 current um, as as sort of a, a benchmark because it, I feel like every one of them is is shifting. There's there's no common thread, so I'm not sure if you can point to one that sort of is is closest to current that does not consider. Um, uh, sort of the the moving students from a consolidated school over to Crocker Farm. Is that would that be your your scenario five where you said the um, where you're just adding a new gym? Is that how I should interpret that? I think I think that is I think that's correct. So the current use of Crocker Farm is reflected. Um, here, with the exception of this being a K through five cohort, currently you have K through six at Crocker Farm, uh, but you have approximately 360 K through six students and you have the capacity for 75 pre-K students, although you actually are, are, are running populations a little bit less in that category. So your current um, population of the Crocker Farm school is is right around 400, a little bit over 400, uh, because you have fewer pre-K and a little fewer K through six than perhaps the capacity of the school allows. Um, so said another way, uh, scenario five has students leaving Crocker Farm and new students coming into Crocker Farm. Is that? Well, right, because you're putting the sixth grade into the middle school, you're then um, bringing in other K through five students to fill those spaces. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, so I want to I want to come back to the the cost estimations. Um, and so while I absolutely agree that it's important to look at the cost scenarios for this within the scope of all of the costs and capital costs that we're going to be facing um, as a as a district and as a town. Um, 
but I don't agree that it belongs in this report because this report is specifically about the expansion um, study on Crocker Farm. We didn't look at all the other potential costs in our facing our school district in our town when we looked at the Fort River feasibility study. And these are already old numbers. And, and um, I, I do agree with Mr. Demling's comment that this doesn't reflect necessarily what we're actually going to be looking at and comparing and having to evaluate when we when we do get to that point. Um, so while it's while it's helpful and important to keep that in mind, I, I disagree that it should be included in this report for exactly the reasons that Mr. Demling said, because it suggests that these these costs have been things that have been studied and included in this in this particular study and report. So if 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 folks feel strongly that it should be in there, I would say take this table and put it in as an appendix and, and sort of reference. Oh, by the way, here's what we studied when we did the fe the Fort River feasibility study. But keep this graph um, and this table completely clean as to exactly what the scope of work for this particular study was, so that we have something clean that we can sort of reference as we go forward. It's going to get super, super confusing to compare and contrast all the different enrollment scenarios that are behind these numbers um, that you're showing from, from as the consolidated cost to town, um, because that's not included in this report. So it, it's, without including the entire report altogether, which doesn't make sense because that's not what this particular study group was for. I, I would advocate very, very strongly of, um, for including just a, a cost summary table that includes just the Crocker Farm study that you have conducted here. Because we're making way too many assumptions on all of the other configurations and, and discussions and decisions that have yet to even be made on a consolidated project. Um, Steve Schreiber. Hi, Jesse. Hi, Richard. Um, so my question, actually, Dorothy Pam hit on part of my question. So COVID-19, so this presentation is happening. We don't know the beginning, the end, the middle of COVID-19. So um, ADA, for example, changed everything. It changed the way that we perceive space, lots of spaces like bathrooms and hallways and so spaces between desks became bigger. And so what we know now is that it's very difficult to reoccupy a lot of you know, existing schools because of uh, social distancing, uh, um, social distancing rules. So really it's more of a statement than a question, but really the question is, it's hard to look at the occupancy numbers in the middle of a pandemic because we don't know how this will settle down. So we don't know if we'll end up with building codes or school building standards that now require greater per square student per square foot, bigger classrooms. Um, Dorothy had mentioned some interesting things like more safe spaces or abil ability to isolate parts of schools. So. Um, I'm just curious if, you know, in your own work, and I'm sure that you're, I imagine that you're involved in helping districts reoccupy schools, but I'm just curious if you have any insights. And so, as part of the, while I have the floor, I'm like the, the William Barr hearings today. Um, while I have the floor, now I forgot what I was going to say. Um, if you could just go with that question. Sure. Are you, are you asking for us to respond at this time? Yeah, just as to whether or not what your gut feeling is how this might all change. And actually, sure. I know what I was going to say is that we don't know if this is the last pandemic in 100 years or the last pandemic in two years. So, right. Quite right. Um, I will share with you what conversations we've had with other districts and what other uh, consultants are doing, we, we, we're working with Coleron and engineers. They are constantly being asked by other school districts, what should they do? Uh, and they've been looking at different kinds of features in the air systems that they've been proposing in existing schools that want to address COVID-19, such as ultraviolet um, treatment of air that moves through the ductwork or they, what they do is they use a, um, a polarizing technique, putting electrostatic charges 
on the filters and on the air so that the um, particles are much more attracted to the filtration uh, components of a duct. Um, we've also been looking at, is it possible to do bathrooms that are touchless? Um, right. Bathrooms that don't have doors, for example, have just blind entrances. So you don't, similar to what you see in airports. Uh, and we've even, even contacted Asa Abloy, the hardware manufacturer, to see what they've been developing uh, to create door hardware that you don't need to use your hand to open, that you could use either a foot pedal or something like that. So we don't know the answer yet. We do know that a lot of clever people are looking at it. Um, we've talked to food service people who have said that they predict that food will be prepackaged uh, so that children can pick up packaged food and they don't have to go through the line and, and uh, exposed that way. Um, I don't have the answer, Steve. I, I really don't. Um, but it's something that we're all very conscious of. Um, I will share with you as we get more information. I don't know, Jesse, if you can add to what I've just said. No, I, I think that was a good summary. Thank you, Richard. So moving back to questions about this study, Mandy Jo. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one, The first one is with the enrollment scenarios. I am still slightly confused when I do the numbers. Um, 1020 and 840 minusing one grade is getting rid of 180 students. Yet when I do the averages for those each numbers, the K-5 average per grade is 140 and the K-6 average per grade is 145. So I'm, I'm not quite understanding why the difference between K-6 and K-5 enrollments is 180. Um, and if it really is a 140 per grade, you know, that, that scenario five has 120 spots in theory available in that consolidated school. Can you, you know, so my question is, how did you get to those numbers and would it really be possible with keeping Crocker Farm at that 360 students, given some of these numbers to, to it would be a really full school, but it, is it really out of the question that you can do K-6 without a large expansion sort of under that scenario five, but be K-6 and take the consolidated school to 600? Um, and then my next question is on the, um, to follow up from Darcy Dumont's question, on the, the numbers, the cost estimates, um, we have a net zero bylaw in town that new construction has to be net zero. Do these projected cost estimates for scenarios one to five, I guess it's A, B, and C, um, include net zero for that addition uh, in terms of cost? I'll take the second question first. Um, yes, the additions are estimated as being net zero. So we've included the cost of the photovoltaics as well as um, energy reducing measures, um, higher performing thermal envelopes, um, some of the things that we are typically looking at in our net zero building. So that's a affirmative yes. Now back to the first question, which felt actually like a few questions. Um, the, the first question I heard was about um, K6 versus K5 and whether the 840 and 1020 are in fact the right numbers. And, and without digging into this with you in too much detail, I think it may be helpful to point out that the, um, um, no, that may not even help. Hmm. All I can say is we worked with the NESDAQ projections, uh, projections on this. Um, and and I, I do think it, it works out. Um, but I can't support that. So then your, the second part of that question was um, with regard to the 360 K through uh, five students. And could you repeat that second part of the question for me? Um, yeah, I'm, so, so the question was with the scenario five says K5, 840 students. So you only put 480 in the consolidated school, which in theory, given the MSBA process that we're in, 
could be a school we set a, at max of 600 students, that's 120 more students. Given the estimate you've done for an 840 K-5 enrollment, that's 140 students per grade. That leaves us with that scenario five if we were to make it K-6 without room for 20 students over the course of one grade. So I was, my question was, is it really impossible to do a non-expansion Crocker farm and still put K-6 in there, understanding that they, they would be really full schools, but is it actually impossible or could it be done? I understand because you're working with a lower um, student population in K-6 through six based on the K-5 through five student population per year. I see. Well, it's true. If the student population of K through six were less than 1,020, it would open up some options. Um, now that's not consistent with what we are taking from NESDEC and what we've confirmed with the superintendent's office. Uh, but if that were the case, if you had um, fewer, fewer K, K through six students, then uh, it would open up the possibility perhaps of doing 600 at the consolidated school and 360 at Crocker Farm for a total of 960 students. That's um, 60 less. Uh, and then you could keep K through six at both schools. Um, but if we work with the, the NESDEC predictions, we, we end up with a higher total of K, K six students and it, it just won't fit. Um, so 60 students is a significant, significant space requirement. Um, and, and so we've, we've definitely followed the projections um, in, in this study anyways. Andy Steinberg. Thank you. Uh, first, I uh, want to just comment that uh, in, this has really been a very valuable um, study because we need to understand even if we're not going to do anything to add to buildings what the condition of our buildings is and what we need to reserve for future um, maintenance and renovation expenses so this has been um, incredibly valuable on multiple levels uh, comment was made earlier about um, wishing that the cost numbers weren't in there for all um, pieces to it. But I do have to remind everybody that um, this is supposed to document now for this meeting, the horse is out of the barn. So um, we uh, need, and it is valuable information. And it's only a question of whether additional pieces can be added that um, give it context, but it's important that because in the end, as a community, we're going to have to make a decision as to what is the most cost effective approach to take um, in dealing with um, what um, choices we have. Getting to my one question though, under all uh, these various scenarios that you have put forward, um, can all of them be done without closing the school for a period? Um, where is the, or are we going to have to also deal with the swing space issue because um, the school would have to be closed for a period? Okay, good question. I didn't mention that, but uh, yes, we, we have included cost and time in the construction schedule to allow the construction of the addition and the reconfiguration of the interiors of Crocker Farm to be um, to happen while the school is occupied and functioning as an elementary school. So our thinking is that you do not need um, outside swing space to make these projects happen. Thank you, uh, Andy. I really appreciate that question. Since we know from another project we're looking at that there is swing space needed, um, I want to just go back to this issue of cost. And I understand the hesitancy and the feelings of uh, people about that. And I, if the compromise is that it's put in an appendix, that's fine. The reality is this presentation is already a matter of public record. Having said that. I'm just going to say I've been involved with at least um, two other building projects in Amherst where there's costs floating out there. 
and it it's dangerous but it's also educational because it gives you some overall sense and from a standpoint of the council um when we have to look at all the pieces of the puzzle and all of the demands on capital including the potential of repair even if we do nothing uh it is often extremely helpful to have some sense of cost and so um it is what it is and uh in the final report uh, this, i hear it from the school committee that they would like to have the cost portion of that one page make sure that it's in as an appendix only um, but i just want to put uh, it out there that i've never seen a study yet where you haven't had some kind of cost estimates uh, and the one here does go the next step to actually looking at it in relationship to what we might be doing with another school. But the reality is the more we push these projects out, the more they're all gonna cost. So costs are just there. They're, we don't know what they are until we really get down to schematic design and design build. So it's, um, it is what it is. Uh, with that, Alyssa, I haven't called on you yet. Why don't I go ahead and ask if you have questions? Thank you. So it's not to repeat, but speaking of context, the slide provided um, associated with the assumption on what MSBA would pay isn't even explained as to what percentage you're expecting MSBA would pay. So to publish a slide without that you believe includes an MSBA investment without any indication of what percentage you think that is and why that would be true is not helpful. Um, the I'm assuming that our financial investment in this study as a town included not only the meetings but also an actual work product. 18 slides, four of which are identical except for different photos with the same text, um, is not to me what that work product is. So I was hoping that at the beginning of this, we were going to get an explanation of why this is all we had in our packet and why we don't have an actual written report. Perhaps there was a miscommunication at some level, but it's really kind of incomprehensible to me that we were provided just this limited information and not any sort of written report that would in fact add a lot of that context to the conversation. Obviously, you had a huge number, you know, significant number of meetings with a lot of input, and we would be able to interpret this better had we had additional information. So I suppose my real question beyond my frustration is what our next steps are as to what that written report looks like, whether some the information shifted to an appendix, the fact that some things need to be clarified, the fact that we literally are putting something out to the public that has no baseline of what our current enrollment is that you have to make subtractions in hopes of getting to that point is frustrating and obviously could be addressed in that final report. So what are our next steps? I think I want to either ask the consultants that or um, Paul or Mike. Happy to respond. Um, we have written a report. I, it's, it's quite long, 300 pages or so. I'm not sure why it was not distributed to the committees prior. Um, I'm, I don't think that falls on us, but it doesn't really matter I, if it was um, distributed. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, going through the, um, the consolidated school is, was part of the RFP that was given to us initially to, to develop cost estimates for, for that school as well as Crocker Farm. Um, so that's why you see them here. Um, in the report, it is more than just the, the one pager. Um, it, it goes through how we develop the, um, the estimates. There are space summaries for the consolidated school for all five enrollment scenarios. Um, so we've, we've developed every, every room for each of these um, different student populations. And, and we've also um, explained the MSBA participation um, the different reimbursement rates, uh, the effective, different effective reimbursement rates once you take into account the um, various incentive um, that are part of the MSBA reimbursement um, process. So all of that in this presentation is just rolled up in the very last slide, um, but it, it is all given in the report for, for review. Um, 
the one next step is that the report will be made available to everybody on both the school committee and the town council, uh, wherever that report resides. Uh, so I'm back to, are there any other counselors that have not asked questions? Because I'll then start back to others. Uh, Kathy Shane, you have your hand up. Am I unmuted? Yeah, yes. Okay. I, I had a, a question um, I meant to ask the first time around on the cubbies. Uh, the, you know, the moving them out to give the classroom more space. Um, I just um, the the uh, comfort level of kids putting stuff away in their own cubby in their classroom. It feels like home in a closet. When cubbies are out in the hallway. Do you have to do something to um, protect them in any way that you go out to get your shoes and your shoes aren't in your box anymore or, or things like that? So I understand it's a space issue. And someone uh, told me that one of the reasons we've been, and Mike will be able to weigh in on this, we, we are having to move some classrooms for COVID reasons up to the middle school out of Crocker because we can't reconfigure the classrooms. And part of it is where the cubbies are, <laughs> you know, that we can't divide up the space. So oh. so just a, it, it was, it, Dorothy's question was about light and air and was, would everything have a window? Mine is if you move them on the outside, do little kids still feel like, you know, they've got their space? Um, does, does that work? And are the Crocker Farm hallways wide enough that that wouldn't make really narrow corridors? So it's a just a space because you said you didn't have to reconfigure everything. So it was a question about the. It's a pretty narrow question, and I just have to say that I do like that what you've done in the whole report and look forward to the three hundred pages because um, I had to. I had to do some guesstimates as I was looking at slides because I, I knew what I w looked up what Crocker's actual enrollment is. So just making sure people have those baselines. I think it's you've done an amazing amount of work for I think we didn't pay you an amazing amount of money. So or maybe from your view, it is on the look. So but on the so my question was about the little cubbies. Sure, thank you. Um, Right, so the, the cubbies at the, at, at the early childhood, pre-K, kindergarten would stay. Um, those ages, I, I think your point about um, having, having your, your space, uh, having your, your things in the classroom, uh, being able to monitor, have the teachers be able to monitor the students accessing it, it is, is really the way to go. And also those rooms tend to be larger to begin with. Um, but they, having them in grades one through five or one through six, sorry, um, it, it is sort of a flexibility inf infringement, as you mentioned. Um, they're, um, they're just taking up space that, that you can't use for anything else. Uh, so if they were moved to the corridor, as we proposed, uh, we would typically use more of a locker as opposed to an open cubby. Um, and so this uh, particular in the upper grades is, is already setting that transition that you're going to uh, move to at middle school uh, and can extend all the way down to uh, grades one and two. We, we see that as well. Um, sometimes grades one and two um, have cubbies in the classroom, frankly. Um, we can see those grades go either way and each district seems to set their preference. Um, and I think either one can work, frankly. Um, we have looked at the width of the corridors, uh, and, and they, they do allow for the, for the lockers, which, which take a foot from the overall width, uh, but they're, they're wide enough. It, it will work. Um, so. Thank you. No, that was helpful, especially the thing that you could do one thing for the, the really youngest children and something for the old, different for the older. Thank you. Yeah. Then when you have your hand up. Yeah. Um, so you know, just to kind of finish, maybe the thread on the um, on the the, the the cost estimates. If you could flip back to that slide, you know, the reason why I'm harping on this point is that you know we're going to get angry emails about this because there's a lot of um, community disagreement about what to do about the building and the project and how much it's going to cost, and 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 people have opinions about this, which is fine and and it's good. 
Um, but you know, our, our job as public officials is to be is to be accurate shepherds of this information. And so when we have studies, we need to make sure they're in scope and we need to make sure that the information we present is clear. And so when we refer people to information, we can say, this is what this information is. And it's not clear what this information is. And so um, I think, um, you know, it's, if, if there is a report that's going to be available and made publicly available, um, you know, maybe the chairs um, uh, of, of, of the council and the school committee uh, could, could work to ensure that um, when, when this cost of what, of what consolidated means, whether that refers to an estimate that you came up with or the Fort River feasibility study or, or some combination of the two um, of what that means and how you derived it so that it's, so that it's absolutely clear um, uh, what that is would, would, would be helpful and, and, and what it, and who's, who's, whose opinion or not it was um, would be good. Um, and, th and, then, and then it is what it is and people can draw their own conclusions. Because I mean, I, cause it feels like I'm being very negative on the estimate and, and, and honestly, I, I agree with a lot of the comments that this is very interesting and useful and helpful and thought provoking information. It's just that in this context, I find it very problematic because it's a primary source piece of information that people are then going to refer to and it becomes problematic because it then becomes a foundation piece in a larger conversation. So, so that's all, but I feel, I feel like if it, can, if it can have its proper context as explained, and I, and I trust the chairs of our two bodies to, to help facilitate that uh, for the future you know, information foundation, that, that's, that's really all I need, so thank you. Carrie Spitzer, you have your hand up for the first time. I thank you. I'd also like to express my gratitude for this report, um, but also some confusion about some of the numbers. Um, if we could go back to the enrollment scenarios, I just wanted to, and, and I apologize, we have all been like going through a lot of other intense um, conversations about other topics. And so I, I'm trying to you know, get back into that piece of my brain that had to do with the statement of interest and the MSBA process. But I just wanted to clarify something. So there's no option here, and there may be, and I just wanted to clarify the reason for this, for having a grade range of K through five with 600 kids total in the consolidated school. Because, and, and I really apologize if I forgot something, but um, I was looking back at the statement of interest, and I think that we said we would do one elementary school with, approximately 600 students in grades K through five or six, but it didn't say whether or not that number, and somebody on the school committee or, or Dr. Morris, please jump in to correct me because I, I, it's late and I could have forgotten this, but did we have a, a cap on the consolidated school that fluctuated with the grade range in, the, on, in our elementary schools? And if not, why? I, I think it might be interesting to if we're trying to get all the information, we and I realize you can't go back and do this, but I'm just trying to understand why we wouldn't have looked at that option. Superintendent Morris has his hand up. Yeah, I, I just I think that's a good question for me to jump in on, and certainly Jesse uh, or Richard can jump in. But <clears throat> I think uh, this is a good good place for me to jump in, <clears throat> and I apologize. Um, so um, you're right, the statement of interest did indicate a school of no larger than 600 students. Um, and one of the options was moving the sixth graders to the middle school to achieve that end. Another option was expanding Crocker Farm uh, to get to that end. And, and so um, I think you're right for how you're saying that. And I see in, uh, in scenario one, um, that we do have 600 students in the consolidated rural school and Jesse or Richard correct me if I'm reading that chart wrong but I think I'm I think I'm reading it right and I think the other range of estimates were for different scenarios that uh, that you know could occur based on a fifth grade moved up so there was no scenario in the statement of interest that indicated the school would be 600 students and multiple things would happen in other words sixth grade moved to the middle school and Crocker Farm would expand. I'm not saying that can't happen, but we didn't commit to that. It was a range of options to look at how one might get there. And so um, I just wanted to make that clear that that scenario was looked at by the um, TSKP uh, folks. Um, and that's option one there. I think the other, you know, this goes back to perhaps I was something at the end of uh, Alyssa's question. This information is incredibly useful for me because one of the things that, that I have to do in the next uh, couple of days 
frankly, is submit to uh, the MSBA a number of enrollment scenarios that we may choose to study. So, you know, th this information. Mike, you just froze. Um, and certainly 600 students is going to be one of the scenarios that we're going, we're going to study because we committed to it. It's in the statement of interest. There's no surprise there. Uh, one is going to be a much smaller one of just what Fort River would be if nothing else changed as we have to. And, and we know what that size is. And, and, you know, then some other scenarios this team worked on are helpful uh, in that regard. But uh, hopefully that answers at least some of your question, Ms. Spitzer. I just thought, you know, uh, I didn't want to put TSKP in the spot of describing something that I felt like I was responsible for. There's one more counselor's hand up, and then I want to make sure that if other people who are on the study committee would like to make any additional comments, we want to make sure we hear from them. So Dorothy? Okay, so my, my interests are really primarily about the safety of the students. And one of the things that was discussed in this report uh, was, um, increases to security and some, some of it were some ideas that were new to me um, to do with window film. Um, and so what I, I thought I'd like to, it'd be a good idea if they could explain the changes in the plan which are focused at security of, of the students in the building. Okay. Back a couple of slides. Do you want to do that, Jesse? Yeah, here we go. Um, there were three items that, that we presented, sort of the biggest three items relative to security. Um, the first one recognizes that the main entrance here has a traditional vestibule and then no, um, no control, no separate doors. And to access the administration, you have to get through that vestibule and then go in this door to the front desk and sign in. Um, and this is something that we've been moving away from in terms of secure school design. Um, you can see here's that same vestibule on a diagram. Uh, what we really want to see is you forced into the administration area to sign in. Uh, we don't want to allow people come through these open doors and just run right into the school. Um, and, and so it involves um, adding a set of doors and a partition here. Uh, and so that's something we would include in the project or we recommend including as part of this, um, this study. Um, that's one item. The second item was the gym and the cafeteria access. Um, we, we see these spaces used after hours uh, by the community. Sometimes Parks and Rec is running basketball in the gym or um, you, you know your programming better than I do. Um, but the, the issue is that once you let people into these spaces after hours, who's checking to make sure that they've um, not gone into a space they're not supposed to be. Um, so it, it's preferable to have these after hours spaces all zoned in one area of the floor plan with a set of doors that you can keep shut. So that's part of why we're moving the gym over by the media center uh, so that we can get the cafeteria, gym and media center all in one zone of the building uh, and that we can control access to the academic parts of the building. Uh, and that zoning of the building is a good thing in terms of security. And then finally, to get to your question, um, all of the classrooms, of course, have daylight and views um, and windows. Um, and, and so these windows um, could allow for an intruder who could break the glass and, and, and build that way. Um, to delay the um, amount of time it takes to enter the building through the, through the windows, uh, we could apply a security film, which would um, cause the glass to stay intact, even though it's broken. And so a intruder could eventually break through it by um, hitting it over and over, but it would take more, more time. Uh, and the idea is to slow down an intruder. So um, the film makes the glass intrusion resistant. Um, that's my explanation. Thank you. Mandy Jo? Yes, thank you. Um, I hope this is a quick question. Going back to the enrollment sizes um, and classroom sizes, can you tell me uh, what classroom sizes were assumed for each of these classrooms? How many students would be in it to get to the enrollment for each school? And whether that classroom size is what is um, recommended by MSBA or whether it's smaller? That's a good question. Um, 
the way the enrollments work is we're dividing the number of students that we're given in the projection. Um, but I think you're asking about the size of the, the options, actually, uh, because we're talking about a certain amount of space required as the enrollment increases. Um, and uh, that, that is driven by a certain number of students per classroom. We've been working with 20 students per classroom for Amherst for both this study and the Fort River study. Um, this results in additional classrooms to what the MSBA would, would recommend. Uh, the MSBA guidelines vary with the number of students per classroom. It's like 18 for kindergarten, but then it goes up to like 24 for um, the upper elementary grades. Um, and, and so um, the reason that we end up with more classrooms for Amherst um, than, than the MSBA guideline is that um, I, I believe it's a combination of your classroom um, policy, it, um, your teacher union contract, um, and, and it's also good practice uh, for a district to target smaller um, numbers of students per, per classroom. So um, that said, the actual size of the classrooms that we're looking at is right in line with the MSBA guideline. Um, and uh, MSBA won't let you go below a certain threshold, 900 square feet. And we're looking at a little bit over 900 square feet for the Crocker Farm classroom. So they, they meet the guideline, they work. Uh, yeah, so I guess my question was towards the number of students per classroom. So you did answer that question. If it, it sounds like it was targeted at 20, whether or not that's what our school committee's guidelines are. Um, and so, and, and it, I, I guess I'm not sure we can answer this question. Is that what we would target? Would we ignore the school committee guidelines when we target for planning, building new schools? Like if, I guess if the question would be if the building committee decides to use the target numbers for the school committee instead of the MSBA numbers, that would result in a larger school with less reimbursement too? Correct. And we've calculated that that way. So we've tried to take the information that we were given. I see the superintendent has hand up, so I'll stop in just a second. We've tried to take that information and build it right into the options and the um, reimbursement percentage projections. Mike, uh, Superintendent Morris. Yeah, I just wanted to say that there's a school committee uh, in, in their policy handbook, uh, which is accessible online. They have class size guidelines at the elementary level, and this is what we're talking about at the elementary level. And uh, of, you know, at the primary grade level, at the intermediate grade level, and the upper grade levels. Right now, our class size is, is uh, at least last year, was 19.1. Uh, so, you know, 20 is a good, good estimate. Uh, for where we are, and that is based on that. When we went through the process the last time, uh, we're not the only district with class size guidelines that are lower than the MSBA. I think, Jesse, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they, they more or less estimate a 25 or some number in the mid 20s, um, and they acknowledge that many districts will require that goes on in terms of reimbursement and spaces and where there are allowances and, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's not cut and dry, and, and I appreciate Jesse's term estimate, because I think that is an estimate, because having lived through it, uh, you don't always know exactly the percentage of the front end, but I think there's a reasonable range that one can, you know, take some steps to assume, uh, but, but I think it gets, and I don't want to wade into the whole financial <laughs> discussion that people were having before both ways, but I think the, the key, it's capital E estimate, right? Um, uh, but, you know, it, it is based on um, school committee policy that's been longstanding, uh, on class size in the district, and uh, MSB is aware of that and works with you on that. Okay, I want to make sure that uh, we check back and see whether any of the other members of the committee, uh, Derek, uh, Man um, Mar Maria Kapecki, or Tony, uh, or Ben, we haven't heard from you. Anything else that either any of you would like to add? Maria, please go ahead. Thank you. So um, I want to ask, answer a couple of questions that, that were asked. Uh, Kerry was wondering about if the, uh, if the consolidated school was 600 kids and it was K through five, what would that do to Crocker? 
Well, uh, it would mean a 240 student school, which would mean two classes per grade uh, at Crocker, which is very small um, compared to what we now have. And it would bring into questions about how to uh, distribute district-wide special ed and so on. And so that, uh, that was not something that was pursued. Um, there were there have been some questions about uh, the numbers that we've gotten, and uh, I think Jesse did point out that this was all derived from the Fort River Feasibility Study, which did an extensive analysis of a range of different enrollment options. If you'll recall, that looked at options that were 315, 360, 420, and 460 students. Um, and from that, you can extrapolate, and we also did extensive space summaries, which were reviewed with the district. Um, to determine what would be the square footage and what would the size of the different schools be to complement um, what would have to be at Crocker Farm in a two school system. So that is where those numbers came from. Likewise, uh, with the Fort River Feasibility Study, which I did serve on, um, we did an extensive analysis of the MSBA reimbursement. Um, and that was brought into this study and we used a modest number not not even we uh, for for msba msba reimbursement how you do things will determine uh the final number that you get for reimbursement and we did study that and we used a mid-range number for that final table because we didn't want to give something that was you know too generous or too too low so uh that's where those numbers uh were all uh derived so I think the, the main point um, that I'd like to talk about with this study is that um, when Tony and I proposed this, we knew that we had to find out, uh, we were going to find out what was going to happen at, uh, for one half of a two school system, but we didn't have any information on Crocker. And that's what we have now. We have a good understanding about the needs of the facilities. And I think we have a much better understanding about the educational needs, which aren't currently being met. So even in scenario five, I just want to point out that it may be approximately the same number of kids. It's actually uh, scenario five is a little bit larger than what's currently at Crocker Farm. It's that the current building is not meeting those educational needs. And that's information we have now. And what what we can do with these different scenarios and these different building options is to understand what it would be to provide parity to all elementary school kids in the town, both from an educational and resource standpoint, accessibility, security, um, and that's what this study aimed to do. And it offers a variety of building options and a variety of enrollment uh, uh, pairings uh, for us to consider and the cost estimates for those projects have to be taken together. This is, this is going to be an, a full elementary school uh, system and we need to know what that's going to cost for all our elementary school students. Thank you, Maria. Anybody else from the committee? Yes, Peter, you have your hand up, not from the committee, but from the uh, school committee. Just briefly that I appreciate the study, but that I don't think it was in scope to determine whether Crocker Farm is meeting the educational needs. And I don't think that it's met the bar to make a conclusion that it's not meeting the educational needs of our students. Thank you for your comment. Is there any, uh, Derek, yes, please. Um, yeah, I'll just be very brief. I, I appreciate everyone taking the time to, um, to, uh, to, to study this, to think about this. Um, let me just say something quickly about Crocker Farm because I've had the good fortune again to, to work for the schools for almost 24 years and I've been 11 years at Crocker Farm. Um, we have a beautiful school. We, we have a, a wonderful staff. We have a, a fabulous community. Um, last year we had 416 students on the property, probably around 100. I know this sounds a pretty high number, but anywhere from probably 90 to 100 different staff working in the property every day. Um, it's a pretty tight fit when you've got that um, fairly large number of um, young people and, and adults working in the building. Um, 
I forget who it was that said something earlier. It, it perhaps was Darcy, but I apologise if I got if I got it wrong here. But someone had said earlier that they were they were a tad worried about about this notion of Crocker Farm becoming like a second class citizen type thing. And um, as someone who perhaps as a young kid was a bit of a second class citizen, um, it won't happen. Um, it's not going to happen. Like I know maybe it's bold at night or at night to say something like that, but. We've certainly, and, and Mike was the principal before I was the principal there, we've assembled a very strong, um, high quality group of teachers at, at Crocker Farm and we continue to to, uh, to hire really good people. So um, as a principal, I, I would like to see, a, a, you know, obviously a few improvements and that's, um, there's nothing wrong with um, making things better um, because I think we are do, doing a, a tremendous job of meeting the needs of our students. Um, but. I do think that whatever happens in the line, Crocker Farm will continue to remain relevant. I mean, I hope they continue to be, if Mike allows it, to be the principal for a little bit longer. And, and, and I fully intend for us to, to stay highly relevant in the, in the whole conversation. But I appreciate everyone uh, taking the time tonight to be thinking about us. Thanks, Derek. Uh, ben, you have your hand up, please. Yeah, so uh, so I kind of wanted to wait to weigh in because uh, I kind of have to comment as two separate entities tonight. So I, I kind of want to identify that right now I'm speaking as a uh, school committee member for the first part of this comment and the second part will be as a uh, member of this particular committee. So um, I, I just kind of wanted to weigh in on the, uh, the cost estimates and I kind of wanted to keep focus again on that word that it's, a, it's an estimate. And so when we're looking at the estimates from this project as compared to a previous study, involving an elementary school. It, it kind of just gives us a, a bigger picture of what to expect, not an exact picture. These aren't the exact numbers that we're gonna be dealing with at the end, right? So I, I kind of feel like the comparison actually is relatively useful there. And I, uh, I would just add that it, it's probably important to highlight the individual numbers, right? How much it's going to cost for each scenario and so on and so forth. And so from, the, uh, from my day job perspective, I just want to say that this was, this was, a, this was a great experience in terms of, of being able to understand the overall picture in a very in-depth sort of way and kind of, it's, it's, there are elements of this that are going to help us, help guide us in terms of uh, continually improving and maintaining Crocker Farm. And it's, it also gives us a sense of what we could look, what we would, could potentially see as uh, some, some cost and some, some possibilities down the road if we are going to actually uh, improve the, the overall quality and conditions of the school in terms of like a renovation or something like that. Thanks. It's interesting to have both your perspectives. Uh, any other comments from the committee? We have very few people in the audience. I am going to ask if there's anybody who would like to make a public comment at this time. Okay, I'm not seeing anybody. Then in that case, I'm going to wrap this up since we really estimated that it would only be about an hour and a half. I wanna thank uh, the committee, especially because uh, you did this study under very unusual circumstances. Uh, I look forward to the 300 pages. I don't promise to read every page, but I'll get to the uh, But much more importantly, um, this came as a, a citizen, a resident request to JCPC. Uh, and the school district may have had it in its mind, but you gra we grasped it and we ran with it. And the good news is we now have a picture of all three of our elementary schools. And so as we go forward into this next phase of planning our new elementary world for Amherst, uh, this study kind of completes the group. And we wanna thank all of you that worked very, very hard on this committee. And we're glad we could uh, join together this evening to hear the report. So with that, I'm going to ask Allison, we don't vote to adjourn. So we just, I just declare adjourn, but go ahead, Allison, do whatever you do. Do a, with, well, I'll, I'll move to adjourn the Amherst School Committee. Is there a second? Second. So, sorry, was that uh, Ms. Lord? And Spitzer, so whichever one you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, moved by McDonald, second by Lord. Um, roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Um, Mr. Harrington? 
Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. McDonald, aye. We're adjourned. Thank you. And the town is adjourned. Enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.